is Ghana tonight. Coming up next, uh, some news uh, developing story we've been following quite closely. A soldier has been reported dead. Five others in critical condition following an accident in Binduri in the Upper East region. We're live in the region right now to give you updates of exactly what the situation is here on Ghana tonight and really uh, worrying developments we're seeing right now. We're going to put a video that we got uh, just uh, the early part of the evening today. One soldier has died or reported, been reported dead and five others seriously injured in a ghastly accident in Binduri in the Upper East region. That's the formation that we have right now. The soldiers were set to be returning to base after providing escort for a government official when their truck reportedly skidded off the road in Bazwa and some assaulted. Uh, our Upper East Regional Correspondent Castro Senela has been following this accident when it happened hours ago. He's joining us on Zoom right now. Castro, what more can you tell us about this rather unfortunate incident that we understand has led to the death of one military personnel? Right, Alfred, it's really, really unfortunate that um, um, at a time when soldiers are needed, we're losing them. Yes, so this uh, afternoon we got information that there was an accident involving some military officers who were returning from Boko to their base in Bazwa. Uh, there's a military base in Bazwa in the Binduri district. So we understand they had, that, they, that they had given some escorts uh, to a government official who had visited the Boko area and on their return, their vehicle unfortunately veered of the road and ran into uh, i mean the road sites and some have started many times uh, when eyewitnesses got there uh, we understand that uh, a lot of the, the the officers they were injured one person uh, died on the spot and the other five i mean some other five occupants of the vehicle the military truck uh, are currently in critical condition we understand that um, the five have been taken to the Tamil teaching hospital where they are being treated of their injuries. And uh, we also understand that th these five people, or the soldiers, are in really bad uh, mean shape. But the hope is that they will get better. Now, now, based on the preliminary information that you've picked up as a result of this accident, what exactly led to their vehicle uh, skidding off the road and, and some assaulting us, as was earlier reported? Right, Alfred, I've been in touch with the police and even... Uh, some military officers uh, in Bazoa, as we speak now, I've just got a phone, off the phone with one of them who was telling me the actual cause of the, I mean, the accident is yet to be ascertained, but it is believed that they uh, may have, you know, hit a pothole on the road. That is what I'm getting from sources within the military itself, but that is not ascertained. But I'm keeping my my contacts very strongly so that when I get more information, I come through. But this... Uh, has sort of, I mean, sort of, I mean, affected, uh, made the military officers within the area very sad. I spoke to a couple, a lot of them on phone, and they tell me it's sad news for them, considering that they've lost one of theirs. I mean, uh, like I said earlier on, this is a time that they are needed because they are doing so much in terms of keeping the peace in Boko and its surrounding areas. And so more and more men are needed on the ground. And so for them to lose uh, one of their own is something that is not really good. I see. And uh, especially because of what we are saying now, that particular area, you know this area quite well. I mean, is it an accident-prone area or this is a case in isolation, this particular accident? Um, I would want to describe it as a, as a case in isolation because we don't hear so much of accidents on that particular I mean, uh, part of the portion of the highway, even though portions of the Boko, uh, Polmankong uh, highway that is still under construction, uh, I mean, I mean, have a lot of defects, but not that particular area where the accident happened because I know Bazwa so well. And from Bazwa all the way to Boko town, the road is relatively very, uh, say, I mean, very smooth. Uh, so it is surprising that that accident happened there. But um, the, like I stated earlier on, my sources say um, it uh, could be that the vehicle hit a pothole and skidded up the road, like uh, we said this in the report. But we are waiting for an investigation by the police because the police were there. The military too were, were, was also there. I mean, officers of the military were also there to um, sort of investigate and to find out what really led to the accident and also to convey the injured and the remains of the vehicles in the accident to their base in Bazoa.
Castro, thank you for the update. Uh, the Castro Senora is our uh, Upper East Regional Correspondent, giving us updates on this rather unfortunate uh, development where he's learning the accident um, that has led to the death of a military officer who is said to be in a vehicle uh, that delivered some services to a government official in that part of the region. We'll keep an eye on this one and be updating you more here on TV3. But this is your election command center coming up next. The battle for the parliamentary majority will likely be settled tomorrow, Thursday, October 17, uh, when the speaker is expected to uh, deliver his recent ruling. But the Memphis Central constituency is one of to watch because of how things are playing out right now. That conundrum, you'd want to call it, um, in that constituency is, is one that especially the NDC is looking at quite closely and also uh, how the other members of parliament in this caught up in all of this would also uh, be looking at how things play out in that particular constituency. This is your election command center and we are keeping an eye on this one big tonight. Well, in a significant legal development, the National Democratic Congress, the parliamentary candidate for the Amemfi Central constituency, Joanna Jankujo, has been disqualified by the Electoral Commission for contesting um, in the upcoming 2024 parliamentary election. Now, this decision comes following that order for interlocutory injunction issued by the High Court in the second year. We're going to get into the timelines. Dennis Pobre with them is going to be joining me shortly. But the Electoral Commission issued a statement, which we have a copy of today, communicating the, the decision to disqualify this candidate uh, for the Amemfi Central constituency. And bear in mind, this constituency, the sitting member of parliament, is one of four MPs that the Honorable Haran Idris has petitioned the Speaker to declare that seat vacant because... The incumbent MP has decided to go independent because of some issues that he says he wasn't too happy about during the second primaries. That's a rerun of the primaries of the NDC in that Memphis Central constituency. And we're going to run through the details of the Electoral Commission statement communicating the disqualification of Joanna Kojo and why this has been questioned by a number of lawyers, whether the Electoral Commission really did the right thing in communicating this disqualification. This is the statement from the Electoral Commission. We've got a copy of it. It says the Commission's attention has been drawn to an order for interlocutory injunction dated 31st of May 2024 in respect of a suit entitled Jedu Frimpong and four others versus Joanna Jankujo. That's the elected parliamentary candidate of the NDC in the Amemfi Central constituency. The NDC was also joined in this suit, plus the Electoral Commission by the High Court in 2nd D. The order states as follows. One, it is ordered that until the final determination of the matter, the affected parties are restrained as follows. The first defendant, that is Joanna Kujo, the parliamentary candidate of the NDC in Amefi Central, as a respondent, is restrained for, from holding herself out as a duly elected NDC candidate for the Amefi Central constituency. The second and third defendants, that's the Electoral Commission, the NDC, their agents and officers for holding out, allowing the first defendant from the respondent to be held out, dealt with in any way, recognized or afforded any rights or privileges as duly elected NDC parliamentary candidate. And also, it concludes this statement, the said order has neither been stayed nor vacated. Hence, the commission is bound by saying, in this regard, they are writing to inform the candidate that she cannot hold herself or she has been disqualified from standing as a candidate for election to parliament in the Amemfi Central constituency. So this is the letter that the Electoral Commission wrote to Joanna Kujo, who is the parliamentary candidate, elected parliamentary candidate for the NDC in this Amemfi Central constituency. And this constituency, although it's, it's, it's a win for the NDC, they've won it since this constituency was created all throughout the period till the year 2020, the dynamics and the nuances in this constituency in terms of the electoral history will tell you 
one particular story, especially with respect to the incumbent member of parliament who has decided to go independent because of these issues and when he lost the parliamentary primaries. We're going to run through the timelines in a bit, but let's hear from the incumbent parliamentary candidate and then also uh, the member of parliament for this particular area who has decided to go independent. Take a look. You cannot eat your cake and have it. I mean, there has been precedent that the former uh, former MP also uh, did the same, and his seat was declared. Um, um, well, not because two months you can't have a, a re-election, and uh, he went ahead and won the election. So, um, but because there is precedent, because Honourable Right Honourable Speaker Michael Quay um, declared that uh, that was the way to go. But if you go to the article very well. If you go to the article and the, the condition in the constitution, it says that uh, you cannot cross cabinet. I mean, if you are an NDC, you cannot tomorrow get up and say that you are MPP. And I believe that that is why they put that clause there, to avoid that. Because before, when that clause was not there, if you are an NDC, the next day you could walk to the other side and then come back. So prevent that, they put this clause. I believe, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an engineer. and that, you, if you are independent, you cannot um, change your uh, situation in parliament there, that you are independent. Now you want to become an NDC or MPP. I believe that is the uh, reason why that clause was put there. Because now I have not declared that I have left the party. I am only uh, declaring my intention that in the next parliament, in the next parliament, I am going to be an independent. And so if somebody is also an NDC or MPP now, and he wants to go independent, he's not saying that he's leaving MPP. He's saying that in the next parliament, he doesn't want to go with MPP again. I believe that's how I understand it. So you are ready for the consequences if the city is declared? Oh, of course. If you take any action, there should be a reaction. So you must be ready for it. Okay. What is it? Because if you say you are going independent and uh, the speaker rules that your seat is vacant, what can you do? You cannot uh, challenge law because there has been prison already. I know there has been prison. But sometimes in court, judges make mistakes. So it Oh, so th that's Peter Yalkwa Chakwa. He is the incumbent member of parliament for the Memphis Central Constituency. Decided to go independent. This actually is on the ticket of the NDC. Decided to go independent. He has a very interesting history in that of Memphis Central Constituency. You want to stay with me and follow us closely because I'll tell you about it. But there are some timelines to what's happening in this Memphis Central Constituency that has gotten us to this point where the Electoral Commission has declared that Joanna Kujo, the parliamentary candidate-elect for the NDC in the Memphis Central Constituency, has been disqualified. What are those timelines, Dennis? Well, so we go back to 2023, May, May 13 to be specific, where the NDC held its first primary election in the Memphis Central Constituency. And in that election, the outcome was as follows. Joan Jan Kujo came out with 756 votes. Peter Yao Kwachi Aka, who is the incumbent, sitting member of parliament, got 575 the rest, Daniel Apia, 73, um, Kat Mac Ayn got 39, and then Elijah Jones got two. Fast forward to June the same year, 2023, five applicants, including one Jedu, Rimpong, and then others decided to sue Juan Kujo. They sued the NDC and the Electoral Commission as respondents in that particular action. Mm -hmm. What they were seeking to, to do then, or the basis for doing so, was that they raised allegations that Juan Kujo forged her voter's ID card and then the NDC party card. And that was the beginning of all the troubles in that constituency when it comes to the NDC. Mm. Now, what do we see next? We see that in September, 2020, September 3, 2024, um, this was when it was nearing for the EC to open nominations, uh, for, I mean, filing of nominations. So the NDC Functional Executive Committee met and they decided that that particular election, which was now a subject of litigation in court, mm -hmm. be annulled, and then they ordered a rerun of that election, providing timelines within which that was going to be done. So the open nominations on September 6, 2024, filing and vetting was done the following day, September 7, and then that same day, there was vetting. But unfortunately, um, the MP, the certain MP, Peter Yaokwachi Aka, decided to withdraw a night before the election. So what happened was that it now meant that Juan Kujo had to run the election or to go on a post. 
ultimately, she was declared the winner of that election. And that election was supervised by the Electoral Commission. We have a video to that effect where mm. she was declared. Then, on, the, on September 9 to 13, was when the EC opened for filing and nominations. Mm -hmm. What that meant was that if the NDC was not able to finish this election by September 8, by the time they would have been done with the court case, which is still pending, they wouldn't have been able to meet this particular deadline, deadline. because filing of nominations would have closed by September 13. So, Joanna Kujo was able to file her nomination on, before the end of the deadline. Right. On the day that the deadline elapsed, that is when the EC closed nominations, there was a petition, we understand, for her disqualification sent to the EC. Mm. Again, on the 24th of September, there was a follow-up letter on that petition for her disqu disqualification. Now, what we do not know is what has transpired between the time the petition was sent, the time the follow-up letter was sent, and then October 10, which is just a few days ago, where there was a letter from the EC disqualifying Joanna Jankujo, citing the, the court case, including the interlocutory injunction that was granted by the courts as the basis for her disqualification. Now, some members in that particular constituency today, this morning, mm -hmm. were agitated. In fact, they had picked intel that the lady was disqualified, but they could not understand why. In fact, they had seen this Electoral Commission letter that we, we put on the screen. Yes. Given that, that notification. Yes. So, so there was some, some kind of a, a, protest, a, a protest. An agitation. We in there. But we have videos of that. Yeah, we have a video let, of that let's, let's indicating and explaining why they thought it was mm -hmm. not in the right light. We want to state unequivocally that we will resist such moves with all our might and strength since there is no basis for her disqualification. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, Madame Joanna went through the right processes of free election supervised by the EC after the leadership of NDC at the national level annulled the, the first primaries that initially elected her. This action of party leadership was based on reliefs sought by the petitioners who thought she wasn't validly elected. It is instructive to note that contestants from the first primaries all participated in the second primaries that eventually re-elected Madame Juanejan. Interestingly, Mr. Adonis, the district electoral officer of the EC in Amalfi Central, was the one who supervised the process of electing our candidate. Our candidate, Madame Juanejan, successfully filed her nomination with the EC without any problem. Yes whatsoever and was subsequently introduced to the general public by the EC returning officer for Memphis Central as the NDC validately third election parliamentary candidate. We are therefore surprised with the turn of event being perpetrated by Dr. Bosmanasare and Mr. Adonis just to do it, just to do the bidding of the these were the constituents there yes. and, and placing on record that they still wanted her that's Joanna Kujo to be recognized as a parliamentary candidate. Yes, and they the basically NDC. recount all that has happened so far, mm. and they are expressing surprise as to the turn of events. They are making allegations as to who is, is behind what has now come to be the disqualification of Joanna. But of course, they make categorical statements about who supervised the election. Because when you look at the timelines, I mean, at the time that the EC purportedly supervised this election, this particular court case, which has now been cited, was already in the known. It has already been pending since the... Uh, uh, um, since June 2023. True. But of course, let's look at that declaration that was made um, when Joanna was declared the, the PC for the NDC in that primary election. I therefore declare Joanna Jamkudo as a parliamentary elect for the National Democratic Congress and the Central Constituency. Thank you. I therefore declare Joanna Jamkudo as a parliamentary elect for the National Democratic Congress and the Central Constituency. Thank you. Well, so there you have it. Now, the fundamental question that uh, you, know, you have lawyers asking is why the Electoral Commission supervised this rerun of the primaries in the Memphis Central constituency 
when this interlocutory injunction that they refer to in this disqualification letter was actually still in force or pending as we speak. So we're going to engage the NDC shortly about this, but this is a constituency that based on the historical records in terms of the voting pattern, the NDC has won over the period. And I'm going to show you up in a bit. Take a look at this. Right from 1996 at the least, the NDC won that constituency with 67.7% um, of the total valley vote cast. Fast forward to the year 2000, they won it again with 54.3%. But take a look, you see the NPP also closing the gap uh, between 1996 and 2000. But in 2004, take note of the year 2004, because Peter Yao Kwachi Aka, the incumbent member of parliament for this constituency, on the ticket of the NDC, was actually the NPP candidate. It was the NPP candidate in the year 2004 in this Amen Central constituency, and he pulled 47.7% of the votes as against the NDC candidate who won in that election in the year 2004, 48%. So it was a closely contested election in the year 2004 when Peter Kwachiaka contested on the ticket of the MPP, 48, 47%. Now fast forward to the year 2008, Peter Kwachiaka left the MPP and contested as an independent candidate. And he did a, quite a good showing, which I'm gonna show you in a bit. He put over 7,700 of the total valid vote cast representing over 26%. Now, in the year 2012, the NDC won it 54.8%. Peter Kwachiaka did not contest in that election. He came back in 2016 on the ticket of the NDC, won that election, and then in 2020, he retained that seat on the ticket of the NDC with 58.1%, and in the year 2016, 50 in fact, so if you look at the trajectory in the margin of victory for him, he increased the NDC's votes between 2016 and 2020. What's interesting is that the man that we're talking about is now going into this 2024 election, not as an NDC candidate, he's going to go independent, but he has a very interesting history in this constituency. He's contested as an independent candidate before. He has contested as an NPP candidate, Peter Kwachiaka, the current member of parliament for Memphis Central. The one you, we heard him talk about, he going independent. He has contested as an NPP candidate, contested as an independent candidate, and then also now he won that constituency when he contested as the NDC candidate in 2016 and in 2020. So the decision to go independent, he's not new to it. But then again, in that year, 2004, when he contested on the ticket of the MPP, 2008, on the ticket as an independent candidate, he did not win that particular constituency. But he's not going into this election on the ticket of the NDC. These are the two. If the NDC, as we have understood now, is going to challenge the decision by the Electoral Commission to disqualify their candidate, Dr. Mrs. Joanna uh, Jankojo, this is the NPP candidate for the Memphis Central constituency, Dr. Albert Redu Akon. These are the, the two front runners in this particular constituency. So that's what we do know right now. And, and whether the NDC is what, what they're going to do going forward. But we do know the director of legal affairs, Dr. That's Edwin Edujitamaklo. Uh, Godwin Edujitamaklo has indicated that they are going to contest this decision uh, by the Electoral Commission. And for the matter being that the Electoral Commission cannot go ahead to declare that Joanna Kojo as disqualified to the extent that the matter has not even been determined as yet by the court in second day. So that issue in contention is whether the Electoral Commission did actually do a good job in disqualifying her when the matter has not been determined as yet by the courts. So that's the question on the table right now. Gordon Edwin Tamaklo is joining us right now. He's Director of Legal Affairs for the NDC. Uh, Mr. Tamaklo, good evening to you. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening and good evening to your viewers. So as we're seeing now, 
the Electoral Commission communicated the decision to disqualify your candidate in this Amenfi Central constituency. The incumbent who is on the ticket of the NDC has decided to go independent because he fell out with the party. What's going to be your next step in contesting the Electoral Commission's decision? Okay, so um, as you pointed out, the Electoral Commission, uh, in the, the letter dated 10th October, communicated the said uh, disqualification. Quite clearly, the Electoral Commission, I'm sure, with the benefit of hindsight, will note that they are deeply in error. That error, we have different avenues to have that error connect, uh, sorry, corrected. Um, yesterday, we sent a letter to the Electoral Commission, um, and in that letter, we have communicated our disapproval with what they have put out. Many options are available to us. I'm not willing to disclose that on air. What we want to say, that the Electoral Commission so much, so much, cannot support to disqualify a person from being elected as a member of parliament. That does not lie in their mind. But uh, like I pointed earlier, I would use your platform to encourage the rank and file of our party to remain calm whilst we solve this problem. But uh, you know as well that the incumbent member of parliament is also a subject of a petition in Parliament by the Honorable Harun Idrisu because he has decided to go independent. And so clearly, that's one that you know, the party would also have to deal with because he's had a good showing in the constituency in the year 2020. He's not a man that you want to wish away, at least based on his history in that constituency, having contested as an MPP candidate brother, before, brother, as an independent okay. candidate before, is with it not? Respect. With respect. The person you are talking about was our DC for, I think, uh, five years. Yes. After that, in 2016, remember that in 2016, he defeated an incumbent. He defeated a sitting member of parliament to become the parliamentary candidate. He is in the second term. He went through primaries and lost the primary to Joanna Kujozan, and now started conspiring to frustrate the party's attempt. In fact, he's on video, audio recording, conspiring with the plaintiff that took the party to court. Now, the party decided to rerun. He appeared before the party's vetting committee. The record will show that the signatures that he put on his process were signatures of persons whose signatures were put on the process without their consent, almost like forgery. I see. You understand? And so when he appeared a veteran before the vetting committee, and the veteran made up of our vice national chairman, the deputy director leader, deputy national organizer, a member of parliament, a five strong member, when they pointed out to him his own nomination process, what has happened on it. The fact that the deputy constituency youth organizer signature was forged without his knowledge. When all this thing was pointed out to him, he opted that if that's the case, you go to the contest. And the breaking committee report is there, duly signed by the general secretary of the party. And so the sole person left went through the election. In fact, the election was supervised by the Electoral Commission on the 8th of September. You understand? So I, I, I really do not know what the complaint of. And you see, Alfred, mm -hmm. when you join a political party, at the core of it is the question of discipline. You cannot join a group of people and say, if my will is not done, then the ship must think. Right. In this place, it's a different matter altogether. 
And I said, as for election, you, you can be so confident. May he so rest in peace, Sir John. He's a fair delegate. You can be so confident that you are going to win. And you go in and lose. We have lost the election before. It was painful. But look, I went home, and uh, with time, I, I recovered. So what is this business? That if I lose an election, an internal primary, then the party must collapse. Who does that? There's a need for discipline. And look, I always tell people that when you join a political party, and the court will tell you, the constitution of a political party is contractual. It's not like our national constitution. It's contractual. You are bound by the debt. Now, you can't say that, okay, I've gone into primaries. I have lost. And if I have lost, then the NDC to hell with it. Why did you subscribe with this membership in the first place? And, and, and Alfred, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. When right. this matter went to court, from the running mix, the, the, the third most powerful position in our party, the political committee, everyone that matters engaged the sitting MP. I see. Adam, and rather behind instigating, if I knew we're going to have this interview, I would have sent you audio recording of the, the, the sitting MP encouraging the plaintiffs to do this to the party. So what do you want to achieve? You have been our DC. After that, you became our MP for eight solid years. Why has the seat been will to you forever? No. No. Well, Council, appreciate you. As you indicated, you, you, you're going to contest this because the fundamental issue is whether the Electoral Commission even did the right thing in going ahead to disqualify your watch, candidate. Watch, watch, watch this thing. I thank you very much. We'll watch this space indeed. Uh, Godwin Edujita Maklo is Director of Legal Affairs for the NDC, joining us there. We'll watch how things play out in this particular space and how things are going to go. But the, the, the man we're talking about, the incumbent MP, who decided to go independent, this is his record in the Amenfi Central constituency. He's, he's one of very few people who, who have this, having contested on both MPP and NDC tickets. He's played left, right, and center. He's, he's played in the MPP field played in the NDC, and he's played as an independent candidate as well. So this path he's taking into the 2024 election, well, it's not new to him. But he actually won only when he contested on the ticket of the NDC. So that's one to also take note of, because the NDC has a stronghold in that constituency. And right from 1996, they've won it. So it just stands to reason that, yes, even though he has some hold, which is only when he contested on ticket of the NDC that he won that constituency in 2016 and 2020. And also served as a DC for five years in that particular district. So that's one thing to take note of as well. That's Peter Yalkwachiaka's numbers in the Memphis Central constituency. We remain your election command center. This is a space to watch. This is a constituency to watch and how things will play out. Well, coming up next, the Speaker of Parliament in a related development about someone our Kinsford Bagman is expected to rule on the petition that seeks to declare the seats of four members of parliament vacant. That decision and this petition brought forth by the former minority leader, Arne Driso, has stirred some significant debate within the chambers um, and also outside of the Chamber of Parliament. In fact, um, we're going to hear a number of people who have been talking about this prime being the man whose case and decision is now being referenced as the precedence for this. Uh, that's the former Speaker of Parliament, Professor Aaron Michael Quay. He spoke earlier on News 360. Why these issues are different in his view. Take a look. 
In order to understand this matter clearly, you have to give it a purposive interpretation. And if you want to give it a purposive interpretation, then you must know, ask yourself, but where is this coming from at all in our, in our Constitution? It is coming from 1979 Constitution and 1969 Constitution. Why did it start at all? Because in the Nkrumah regime, there was this practice of carpet crossing. People moving for the political party that they belong to, upon inducement, upon fear, and so on and so forth. It was a tool used in breaking the opposition. Now, so in 1969, the Constitution famous wanted this not to happen again. Therefore, it's a protective measure. It is a shield for political parties so that their members in parliament will not be induced or move out of their political party out of fear or whatever. Mm. It's all to the constitutional, 1969 constitution making proceedings, you will find this there. If you understand then this is a tool in the hand of political parties to protect them, to protect them. And that is why when the Pomina case came, the first thing that I did when the political party the, that the member belonged to complained was to write to the Pomina uh, MP and ask him to explain and gave him seven days to do so. Sir, Professor, Reverend Professor Aaron Michael Quay, the former Speaker of Parliament, who took that decision uh, in this former Member of Parliament's case. Is it a case of natural justice as we're seeing it playing out? But then uh, how things will be by end of day tomorrow, we will get to know. It's very important because referencing whether the parties would necessarily have to write to Parliament or Parliament in itself can actually take this decision after a member petitions the Speaker. It's one thing to look at. For, but, well, you should be concerned about what's going to come up next because the Sunon Asogli power plant shut down uh, is one that is generating some concern. What exactly will that impact be and the implications for power supply in this country? That's one that we're going to spend some time on here yeah, on Ghana tonight. And uh, in fact, there was a statement that came through from the company uh, detailing reasons why, and that's what you see on the screen there, detailing reasons why they're going to have to do this. ECG owes Sonan Asagli net receivables of $259 million. This is excluding fuel as of the end of September 2024. And if you recall, about a month ago here on Ghana tonight, I referenced the letter that was signed by Toby Athede, the 14th who owns Sonan Asogli, in fact, the foremost IPP in this country, indicating that this was going to happen if nothing is done. Well, we are at this point. So this letter by Sonan indicates that despite Sonan Asogli's decision not to invoice ECG for idle capacity, the debt owed has increased by 23% between January and September 2024 with only 22.6% of the invoices for that period settled through the cash waterfall mechanism. Sonan Asogli has, over the years, been very considerate in his dealings with ECG and the government, and unlike other independent power producers, has not even invoiced ECG for accrued idle capacity charges. And despite this, ECG owes Sonan Asogli $259 million. Their debt has grown by 23% on the net balance between January 2024 and September 2024, and only 20.6% of the invoices have been on it. That's what's happening right now. And what will be the implication of this decision? That the company says they had no choice but to do this. In fact, over 560 megawatts of power is going to, actually has been lost in, in the national grid because of this. Dr. Kobnat Donko is going to be talking to us after this quick break here on Ghana Tonight. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. Let's get into the details of, in fact, the reactions to this development with Senator Soglipa shutting down uh, some, uh, that's his power plan due to some $259 million debt 
owned by ECG. We're going to lose but some 560 megawatts of power as we speak to the national grid. Dr. Kovna Donko is pro is member of parliament and former power minister. Appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. What are the implications of this development as we're seeing right now? Well, we have two risks we face. Apart from the capacity of Sonon and Sogli, slightly over 500 megawatts combined get, uh, going off, there's a possibility of contagion. If other IPPs decide to follow suit, the contagion effect will also be there. But fundamentally, fundamentally, this is a financial problem. In 2023, ECG made a net loss of slightly over 10 billion cities. In 2022, the loss was also around 10 billion cities. And so in terms of ECG's financial muscle, um, ECG is unable to meet its due obligations, and that is a challenge. But it is also important that we don't heap all the blame on ECG, particularly in terms of its losses, because the losses underpin its inability to meet its contractual obligations. If out of the about 10.2 billion CD loss in 2023, exchange losses alone exceeded 8 billion cities. So there is a broader problem of the macroeconomy, the fiscal regime. Mm. When an entity when an entity, about 80% of an entity's operating loss is attributable to exchange losses, I then see. we so, have a challenge. So but by this exchange losses, you mean the depreciation of the city against the dollar, essentially? Precisely. Precisely. The net effect on ECG for 2023 was slightly above 8 billion cities. So the managers of the macroeconomy have a hand in this, especially managers of monetary policy. They have a hand in this challenge. Of course, there is an inefficiency, there are the structural problems of ECG, and that the board of ECG has to take responsibility for. Because if you... If you your operational and commercial losses are nearly 30% or around 30%. There is a challenge. Your markup in any business will not exceed 30%. So basically, we are under recovering cost. And financial sustainability is the biggest challenge of ECG today. Right. But one uh, quick one before we go. Because of this, are we going to experience interruptions in power supply? I mean, and doom so in the coming days because uh, as soon, as soon as ugly, 560 megawatts to the national grid, that's a lot. Well, I don't know what you call doom so, but yes, it will have impact on the availability of power because Sonia Sogli is the single largest IPP. It's the single largest IPP. We can ramp up Akusumbu, we can ramp up Pong, but it will be challenging. It will be challenging, and fortunately, that impact will also be felt by all of us. Appreciate your time, and we'll see how the coming days will look like. Uh, Dr. Komna Donko is former power minister and member of parliament for the Pru East constituency. There's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. On behalf of the rest of the team, we appreciate your company. Here on Ghana tonight. I am Alfred Kansi. Have a good night.